Th thanks for hanging out. I don't know if what's happening in downtown Boston is because of the snow or because of something else, but it was crazy. So I, I really apologize for the delay. It took me uh, 90 minutes to make 3.1 miles. So um, yeah, you can do the math. You're at MIT, right? So all right. Um, I'm the author of uh, Mastering Bitcoin, and so if you're wondering what is Bitcoin and how it works, I have a simple answer. It's just 300 pages long, and it will answer that question for you. Um, you probably don't need the full 300 pages to understand Bitcoin, but it helps. Uh, and it is, in fact, a rather complicated technology, uh, but it's also a very exciting technology. So let me just get a, a feel for the audience. How many people here are familiar with Bitcoin? All right, how many of you own Bitcoin? Okay, and how many are completely new to Bitcoin? All right, just a couple of people. So, the reason I'm excited about Bitcoin is because I'm a geek. And um, I find uh, things like this uh, rather exciting. I get excited over elegant architecture. I get excited over technology uh, that expresses a simple truth in mathematics. And if you take that and you combine it with um, politics that uh, disrupt the banks and allow Silicon Valley to do a frontal attack on the finance industry for the first time in history, that makes me a bit more excited. Um, Bitcoin is exactly that. It's a technology, um, but it's actually not just a technology. Bitcoin is based on a simple invention, and the word simple is used ironically in that sentence, or rather sarcastically. Uh, it's a simple invention created in 2008 by Satoshi Nakamoto, and what it does is it allows you to build a fully distributed system that exhibits principles of trust without a central authority, without a third party in between all of the transactions. Now, that may sound like a simple thing. We'll just take out the middleman from the middle of the network and then it'll work. But in fact, creating trust in a network without a central authority is a problem that has escaped a solution for probably 50 years since it was first expressed in the mid-60s um, in computer science and distributed systems. Satoshi Nakamoto's solution is not a final solution, it's an optimization. But it's an optimization that has worked well enough and scaled well enough to create a, uh, a network that can support up to $10 billion in financial activity. So we don't know how well Satoshi Nakamoto's invention will work or whether it will scale. Uh, but we do know this, it scales to 10 billion, and that had never been done before. So now the question is, does it scale to 100 billion? Does it scale to a trillion? And then we go from an issue of does it work to simply how do we optimize it? And if you're an engineer, you start getting excited about that question, right? Because it's just a matter of scaling and optimization. I get excited about Bitcoin because I like the simple elegance of using a mathematical solution to create trust. Bitcoin creates an environment where you can have hard guarantees about outcomes. So the Bitcoin system itself is a network with a lot of computing power behind it. And this computing power is engaged in a game, a competition. A competition that uses the principles of game theory in order to align the incentive with playing fair. So it's really a giant competition in which if you play by the rules, you win Bitcoin. And it's more profitable to play by the rules and win Bitcoin than it is to try and cheat, because if you cheat, you use up a lot of electricity and you don't win the Bitcoin. And it's really this simple, elegant principle. Now, game theory, if you look at it as a layperson, shouldn't work. It's like, well, if everybody knows how the competition works, won't they rig it somehow and collude in such a way as to cheat the system? Um, they would if they could suspend their own self-interest on a massive scale 
And humans don't do that. Humans don't suspend self-interest on a massive scale. In fact, humans have a tendency to follow their self-interest to get the outcome they want. And Bitcoin uses that in order to create the conditions where the miners, those participating in this competition, are all pursuing their narrow self-interest. And the easiest way for them to achieve their self-interest is to play honestly. And that really screws with their minds because it creates the conditions where trust emerges simply from a competition around these simple rules. Now, all of this is explained in more detail in the book, but I want to give you just for a moment a perspective of the scale of this. Bitcoin's primary competition is based around solving a problem. And this problem is a mathematical problem that depends on chance. Think of it like throwing dice, trying to find a random number. But this random number has to look a specific way. Let me give you an example. If I take a Sudoku puzzle and I sprinkle some numbers on the surface of that puzzle, it will have a solution. Right? That solution appears random, but it isn't. It has to follow certain rules. And if you fill in the right numbers in the right places in a Sudoku puzzle, you find the solution. Now, the great thing about that kind of problem is that if I show you a Sudoku that's already done, you can verify it in a matter of seconds, just at a glance. You can say, yep, it adds up. Right? You can add up the squares and see that everything adds up. And it doesn't matter how big the Sudoku puzzle is, you can still add it up in a predictable time. But if I give you a half-empty Sudoku puzzle and I say, go ahead and solve it, it's kind of hard. It's hard when it's 10 rows by 10 lines. If it's 100 rows by 100 lines, now it starts getting really quite hard. In fact, if I know how fast you can solve a Sudoku puzzle and I make it 10 times bigger, I know it's going to take you about 10 times longer to solve it, and there's no shortcut. There's no way you can cheat and find the solution faster. And so I can keep making that problem as big as I need. Now imagine we're in a giant auditorium, kind of like this one, and we've got thousands of people solving Sudoku puzzles. And we can make them any size we want, they can solve them on their iPads or whatever. And then what we're trying to do is make sure that the problem can only be solved once every 10 minutes. So we set the challenge, and someone finds a solution. They find it in eight minutes. Everybody trying together, someone finds a solution in eight minutes. Well, what do we know? It's not hard enough. So we add some rows, and we add some columns, and we make it a bit harder, and then the next round, someone finds it in nine minutes. Still not hard enough. We make it even bigger. Someone finds it in ten minutes. Okay, now we've calibrated the solution, right? So we can keep doing that. If it takes too long, people start giving up, we start finding the problem, the solution in 12 minutes, oh, we made it too hard. So we're going to shrink the puzzle a bit, make it a bit easier to solve. Now, if suddenly a bus stopped outside and a whole bunch of new contestants came into the auditorium and started solving the problem, we'd have to add a lot of rows and columns to keep it at 10 minutes. And that's basically how Bitcoin works. There's one subtle difference. Uh, the Sudoku puzzle we're solving has you know, a quadrillion rows. <laughs> um, but otherwise, the principles are basically the same. And you can predict how long it's going to take a network of specific size to solve that problem. And then the entire network can calibrate so that it always takes 10 minutes. Now, to give you an idea of how big this problem is, if you took your laptop and you tried to mine on the Bitcoin network, your average laptop would be producing about one mega hash per second, one million hashes per second. That means it can do one million SHA-256 hash operations, which are like throwing a dice or solving a single square in a Sudoku per second. The problem you're solving today takes, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's 40, uh, 42 peta hashes per second. 42 peta hashes per second, and it takes the entire network 10 minutes to solve the problem. So your laptop would fall short. 
you would eventually, by chance, if you just kept at it, you would find a solution to the Bitcoin problem and win the competition. Once on average every five to six and a half thousand years. <laughs> you know, I don't know if your warranty on your laptop will last that long, whether we'll still have electricity around for you to do it, but you could try. Now, if instead of a laptop you used a graphics card, you'd go into some serious power there, and then you'd be cranking away at about a giga hash. So one billion hashes per second. All right. Now you're only 300 million times short of the target of what the network is actually doing. So you take a relatively sophisticated graphical processing unit, you crank it up, and you're only one three hundred millionth of the current power of the Bitcoin network. In fact, if you take all of the six hundred fastest supercomputers in the world, they're a thousand times too slow to even start participating in this. Where did this thing come from? How do you build, in four years, the fastest hashing supercomputer on the planet, completely without anyone noticing? I mean, honestly, most of the world, you think, outside of this room, how many people on the MIT campus know that the fastest supercomputer in the world, if you allow for hashing, is the Bitcoin network. And it's not just fast, it's thousands of times faster than all of the top supercomputers put together. And it was built by bunches of geeks trying to do this in their garage. And it was built in just the last three years, but because of its exponential growth, really just the last year and really just the last six months, right? Exponential curve. Most of the activity happens now. In fact, we've reached a point where the week-to-week -week adjustments of the network are equivalent to the entire hashing power of the first year of Bitcoin. This supercomputing capability is behind the security of Bitcoin. It guarantees that in order to cheat, you have to do more computation than that, sustained. And if you do that, you will be able to take over the computing of the network for 10 minutes and double spend a transaction. Which means that if you buy a pizza, you can use the same money to buy another pizza 10 minutes later. It's really amazing stuff. You have to sustain that for 10 minutes. It would cost you about 3 megawatts of electricity. Uh, do the math. It's not worth doing for a pizza. Um, it's not worth doing for a brand new SUV. In fact, there are very few things that it is worth doing, and all the network has to do is say, "Hang on, I'll deliver in an hour," and then you have to sustain that effort for an hour. That's called six confirmations. So you can then statistically see how much security you buy. Right? Rule of thumb: zero confirmations assuming you're not going to attack this network to do basic small purchases, I'm going to buy a cup of coffee. I would sell someone a cup of coffee on zero confirmations, probably more. One confirmation, I'd sell someone a flat screen TV. Two confirmations, maybe a fancy flat screen TV or a cheap car. Three confirmations, a really nice car. Four confirmations, a fighter jet. Five confirmations, an aircraft carrier. Six confirmations, OPEX budget for the year. Because it scales exponentially, right? So you can see how you can make some bets. It doesn't quite work like that. You know, if you were delivering an aircraft carrier, the good news is that most customers can't take delivery within 60 minutes. Um, and certainly won't get very far. So if they did double spend that, you'd catch them. But if you wait a day, 144 confirmations, mathematically, the computing power that would be required to undo that transaction is absolutely unfathomable. Right? Never happened on Bitcoin. At this point in the network's capacity, unfathomable. So now we've created a mathematical construct that can guarantee a transaction as fundamentally irreversible, providing a core guarantee. 
If this transaction can be verified, and any participant can verify that it's correct, and it is correctly inserted into the network, and the blocks start piling on top, providing guarantee of computation, elapsed computation called proof of work. At some point, the weight of the proof of work on top of that transaction is so high that to rewrite that can be considered near impossible. Now, the software allows you to rewrite it at any point in time. We could rewrite the Genesis block. Theoretically, all you have to do is provide five years worth of proof of work um, in the next ten minutes to override everything that's ever happened in Bitcoin. Theoretically, it's possible. Practically, it's not. So Bitcoin creates this hard guarantee. And once you have a Bitcoin transaction, it's irreversible. Now today, someone tweeted me a really interesting tweet, which was, "Isn't irreversibility a weakness?" Because detractors of Bitcoin are saying that irreversible transactions are a weakness of the protocol. Which is interesting, because if you think about it at a very superficial level, if you're a consumer, and you buy a car, and that transaction goes through, and you don't get a car, and that transaction is irreversible, it's equivalent to giving someone a suitcase full of cash and them driving away. There's no recourse. You can't do anything about it. On a superficial level, you might see that as a weakness. But you would have to fail to understand that Bitcoin isn't just this hard core of a trusted, irreversible transaction. It's also programmable money wrapped around that. So, for an example of how you can overcome this, you can actually simulate a fully reversible transaction by using uh, some of the technologies that exist in Bitcoin. For example, if you combine a three-party multi-signature escrow capability with a delayed transaction that is pre-signed by two of the parties, you basically tell a merchant, here's the money in escrow, it's going to sit there for 30 days. At the end of these 30 days, here's a transaction that gives you that money. It's post-dated, you can't cash it until the end of this time. But if nothing else happens, you cash this transaction. That money is yours, no questions asked. Now you're using the verifiability and the trust core, that nugget, to make a future promise. You're taking that strength of computation and you're making a promise. And that promise is, this money is here today. And this transaction will be redeemable in 30 days. And that is absolutely guaranteed, because it will be redeemable unless one of the parties in the multi-signature combines with the other party to reverse it. So, for example, if you're using an escrow party who's doing arbitration, or you're using a legal process, if you don't deliver the car, the money will sit there for 30 days, but if you don't deliver the car, I'll get the arbitration agent to sign the opposite transaction and get my money back. So now you have a reversible payment. So what you've done there is you've taken a hard guarantee of irreversible payments and you've used it to simulate a pair of irreversible payments, one to the seller, one as a refund to the buyer, and then the decision about which one gets executed is up to a legal process or an arbitration process. So you've taken an irreversible core and you've simulated a soft reversible transaction for consumer protection. Now, think about that for a second because while in Bitcoin you can take the hard core of trust and you can soften it with programmatic guarantees. In the traditional banking system, you can't take their soft mushy mess of intermediaries, counterparties and risk and harden it. There's no way you can create an irreversibility guarantee in the traditional financial system. You can't create a transaction that is guaranteed irreversible. Now, think about what that guarantee means for a second. There is no way in the existing financial system that I can make a payment to you other than cash in small unnumbered bills or maybe bearer bonds in a briefcase. You know, this is beginning to sound like a James Bond, they kidnapped the queen kind of scenario, right? 
That's the only example that you can make an irreversible transaction, hard cash, because anything else can be reversed. Think about the legal system, think about the banking system. If you give me a wire, then the bank can be sued to change that and back it out. Since they control the money, they can be compelled by law to change it. So it's not really guaranteed. There's no guarantee of irreversibility. You can't take a mushy financial system and create any kind of hard promise. Now you're beginning to see some of the really interesting things that arise out of this. You have, on the one hand, a financial system that gives you a hard guarantee on which you can simulate much softer levels of enforcement programmatically. And on the other hand, you have the existing financial system that is an institutional system of money that depends on checks, balances, counterparties, and risk, and that is inherently soft. It can be manipulated. And guess what? It's not going to be manipulated in your interest. Because you're little people. And the financial system doesn't serve little people. We are all little people when it comes to finance. Right? Just ask Julian Assange, whose organization WikiLeaks I can't donate to as a US citizen. Not because it's illegal. In fact, it's a constitutionally protected activity. Freedom of association and expression guarantees me the right to donate to WikiLeaks as a US citizen. But I can't because Visa won't let me, and MasterCard won't let me, and PayPal won't let me. And that has been engineered by the US government without any due process, without any proof that Julian Assange broke any law. But they can manipulate the soft financial system to get an outcome that changes my behavior, because I'm a little person, so I can't donate to WikiLeaks. By the way, you can use Visa or PayPal or MasterCard to donate to the Ku Klux Klan of Alabama. You can use Visa to donate to the neo-Nazi party of America. They don't have a problem with that, but not WikiLeaks. And I have a problem with that. I have a big problem with that. So I like the fact that you can create a currency that delivers mathematical guarantees to the people who own the money and should be in control of the money, rather than a system that is soft and manipulated to deliver guarantees only for some, and you're not part of that some. So that's what excites me about Bitcoin. As I said, it's this combination of elegant architecture and mathematical proof that excites me as a geek, and the political pro process and promise of participatory networks trumping institutions and delivering guarantees in math that you cannot get as guarantees in law. And I would much rather trust in math. Thank you. <laughs> While we're doing this uh, paper thing, uh, let's take questions from the audience. Do we have a microphone for questions, or should I repeat them? Okay, be loud, and I'll, I'll repeat them for the video. Okay. So you mentioned about governments and the s using the system, the, the current system, in order to prevent you from donating to WikiLeaks, for example. But now, now let's imagine that you can donate to WikiLeaks using Bitcoins, right? But then we have a system that is a public ledger that actually will find your address, and we can look at that public ledger, right? Right. Um, that could end up being used by the government also, right? Correct. So, I know we have an anonymity options out there, but today, for example, Bitcoin does not offer that. At some point, it could be. what's your opinion about that particular um, political... So, this is an interesting question. It's a political question. Um, I can donate, let's say I can donate my Bitcoin to WikiLeaks, but then when I do that donation, a transaction from my address to the WikiLeaks address will show up on the public ledger. 
and that can be mined by whoever to prove that I made a donation and therefore to create consequences for me. Um, at the moment, Bitcoin is not anonymous. If you've heard that Bitcoin is anonymous, that's not true. Bitcoin is loosely pseudonymous if you try hard. Um, it can be made weakly anonymous if you try really hard. Uh, strong anonymity on Bitcoin is near impossible to achieve. Right? Because as long as I can associate you with some address, I can track that transaction. If that's what you want to do, then I would suggest converting your Bitcoin to a coin that does offer strong anonymity. At which point you can make a really strongly anonymous transaction with that. And because both are digital currencies, converting one to the other is very easy. Um, if they can convert it back to Bitcoin, it, for them it's seamless. So getting them to accept that, if the value of anonymity is an issue, then it's not a problem. Now, politically, I believe anonymity is extremely important. Anonymity appears to be a privilege to those of us who do not live in countries where you get dragged off in the middle of the night, disappeared and tortured for weeks for expressing an opinion. I can talk shit all day about Goldman Sachs, and no one is dragging me off in the middle of the night. Okay? That's one of the benefits of living in this country. It's a privilege. So that's 5% of the human population. The other 95% live in varying forms of less free than that. Some more free, many quite less free. Anonymity is a privilege here, but it's an absolute necessity in many places around the world. And of course, the problem with anonymity is that these transactions can be tracked forever. So if I do something that is legal today in the US while the US is a democracy, what happens when five years from now Sarah Palin is elected to be the next the first fascist president of the United States? <laughs> And she decides that reading books of a certain type is illegal, and she gets five robed people on the Supreme Court to agree with her, and then she goes mining in the blockchain for all the transactions that bought that book. Suddenly, my anonymity is a problem ex post facto, right? So you have to think about this also from a time. And if you don't like that scenario, you know, replace that scenario with whatever you think is more plausible. You're someone in Venezuela, and things were great, but then some dictator came along and changed things. Or any country in the world where political guarantees exist now, today, but may not exist tomorrow. And your actions today will still be held against you tomorrow. Anonymity is a vital human right. You cannot have freedom of expression and freedom of association without anonymity. Not really. And so I would like to see Bitcoin deliver stronger anonymity guarantees. That won't necessarily happen. Bitcoin may end up being the gold reserve currency, digital gold reserving value for other currencies, hundreds of other currencies, many of which will deliver a strong anonymity guarantee uh, through the protocol. Uh, you can do mathematically provable anonymous transactions in a number of these coins, and you could use those instead. And as long as you have a two-way exchange between the value, you can very seamlessly move from one to the other. Think of it a bit like Bitcoin being the core TCP/IP layer, and once you have that, you can build Tor on top. And it takes special software to move into and out of Tor to get your anonymity guarantees. and That's probably not the best example, because it's not very strong. Now imagine that Tor is an altcoin, and TCP IP is Bitcoin, and you can move from Bitcoin to the other coin and then down again, and use it as a protocol layering mechanism to deliver guarantees of strong anonymity. I expect we will see a world where Bitcoin provides a core fungible currency value layer. On top of which, you'll have protocol layers that deliver micropayments, fast transaction processing, anonymity, and all kinds of other programmatic guarantees, depending on the niche application. Which is why 
there will not be one currency to rule them all, because there is no one application for everyone. Next question. Yes. We've spoken about some kind of more politically motivated uh, applications of Bitcoin. What about, what about like Joe Schmo from Idaho? How might that person benefit from Bitcoin, or you know, somebody from the developed, underdeveloped world? So. Um, Practical applications of Bitcoin for various possible users of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is useful to me today, um, but that's because I use it in a very specific way. I'll give you an example. Recently, I went to Germany to present at a conference with the German Bundesbank. And in my contract, they had the obligation to pay me a small fee plus my airfare. So then we started the Swift code dance, where they didn't have Bitcoin, they needed to pay me via wire transfer. Long story short, it took 16 days. During those 16 days, the euro had a hiccup, and I got exposed to all of the exchange rate volatility of that. Among other things, what was ironic about this was that the German Bundesbank was you know, involved in this conference, I was being paid by a wire. My bank froze their funds for five days, five business days, because after all, who knows who these people are? They're just the Federal Bank of Germany, shady characters. Um, but that demonstrated to me kind of the utility. If you're uh, in the import-export business, if you're doing work with uh, hundreds or thousands of contractors abroad, if you're paying advertising affiliates, like Google is paying 10, 15,000 advertising affiliates around the world, the costs of doing business in that particular case are extremely high. So Google, for example, would be a good candidate for using that. But there are many businesses that do a lot of international business where the current system has far too much friction. Joe Schmo, who lives in Idaho, if he, he only trades with people around him in Idaho, and lives in a country where he has the world reserve currency, and there's only one of those, so sorry to the other 193 countries that didn't get that little bonus, and he has the necessary documentation and credit rating to open a bank account, the level of education, numeracy, and literacy to use a bank account, then Joe Schmo can use Visa in the US dollar. And for 99.99% of cases, at the moment where Bitcoin is with maturity today, Visa in the US dollar is better. There's no question about it. Right? It's accepted in more places, it's less volatile, it's easier to use. Give it a few years, you will be able to do things with Bitcoin that you can't do with the US dollar. You'll be able to use it in more and more places. You'll be able to use it less expensively than the Visa network, and certainly more safely on online trades and e-commerce trades than you can with Visa. But that's really not the demographic, at least not for now. However, there are between four and six billion people who are engaged in international remittances, which have a very high cost and a lot of friction, or live in places where they have uh, very little or no banking facilities at all. So, if you are a literate, numerate owner of a Nokia 1000 who lives in the Amazon River basin and the nearest bank branch is 100 miles away, you could probably do things with text messaging and Bitcoin in the next year or two that you can't possibly ever dream of doing with the traditional banking system. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity. So you've got to understand what the audience is and what the case. This is not something that has universal applicability yet, um, and that's okay. Bitcoin works for me today, and there are plenty of me and there are many more applications that it's working for every day. Yes. When you flew to Germany for a conference, you implicitly trusted that the FAA and the airline uh, you flew on. If you are willing to trust certain parties, you can 
do a Bitcoin which would be much simpler and save a lot of power? Um, yes, you could theoretically do a Bitcoin that would be much simpler and save a lot of power, and so could you. Um, you could implement Fedcoin. The beauty about the blockchain technology is that you can implement it with a more centralized consensus algorithm. You have the recipe, um, and already 500 plus other coins are being created by others who think that they can do it better. And then the market can decide. To me, the most exciting thing about Bitcoin is that by creating the technological infrastructure for a global, instantaneous, unforgeable, secure currency, it opens the possibility of private money to any person on Earth who has a basic understanding of programming and some basic infrastructure. Will you create this particular, completely decentralized, scarce and diminishing supply, looks like digital gold, only 21 million coins, monetary policy coin from that recipe? If you want to, sure, but you can create many other things. And if it's good and useful to someone, it's going to get used, and we'll end up with thousands of currencies. Um, so there's nothing stopping anyone from doing that instead. I don't think Bitcoin is expensive from an energy perspective. Um, it's only expensive because at the moment we need to be able to resist uh, security attacks on a global basis, but we're only adopted on a tiny basis. Bitcoin could scale to support global adoption without the hashing rate going out up at all from where it is today. It's already secure enough to resist global attacks today. And that has nothing to do with how many transactions are happening. Now, if Bitcoin scaled up into millions of transactions and the hashing rate stayed where it is today, that would suddenly make it the least expensive financial processing network in the world ever, and also the most ecological. So, does it look very inefficient today? Yes. How many miles per gallon does the Ford Model T get? Not as much as a Nissan Leaf. That's not a reason to give up the automobile. It wasn't designed to be fuel efficient. That wasn't the problem it was solving. In fact, at the time, arguably it didn't solve any problems. It was a noisy, dangerous, polluting machine that you couldn't run on hay, and there were no roads. So you, we have to look a bit further than that basic thing. Um, and when I do get on a plane to fly to Germany, while I am trusting in the FAA, I'm actually trusting a lot more in the market conditions that create the training infrastructure for air transport pilots around the world. Those market conditions that lead an airline to lose 50% of its sale seats when a couple of its planes fall out of the sky. I trust in that a hell of a lot more than whether a piece of paper says that pilot is okay. Because airlines can and routinely do vastly exceed the minimum standards set by industry. And the reason they do that is market forces, not regulatory institutions. When it comes to banking, however, uh, I would say that we have a massive regulatory failure that I think uh, should and can be solved by mathematical money. Kevin. Um, so, I mean, you know, Bitcoin's market cap is around whatever, five billion right now. Three. Three billion. Oh, okay. So, if, if Bitcoin ever became like a serious threat to Visa or MasterCard, what's to keep them from, you know, dumping a whole bunch of coins, crashing the market, spamming the network, like doing everything they can just to like really shoot consumer confidence in Bitcoin and then roll out, you know, MasterCoin. <coughs> So what's to keep uh, a large adversary from essentially manipulating the exchange rate market primarily by dumping a lot of coins um, and creating sell pressure in order to dump the price, create a confidence crisis and kill Bitcoin? Nothing. One, argue, one might argue that that is already happening. Yeah. We don't know who is selling, why they're selling, or what they're selling and for what reason. Um, 
What stops that from succeeding is that there is a hard core of people who find Bitcoin useful today and for the foreseeable future. Who will Bitcoin network requires two nodes, and a Bitcoin market requires two participants. Anything above that is gravy. And the Bitcoin price worked when it was five million down to that point doesn't kill the currency. For those who believe, it actually makes it cheaper to buy in again. So it creates a second opportunity to get in. And we're seeing that right now. And the price is down at two fifty. Um, I had a party the first time the price hit 250 on the way up. I see no reason to be horribly disappointed because I've been in it for the long term. So it really matters what your perspective is. But Bitcoin worked when I started buying it at five dollars, and I'm not going to go anywhere, and I'm not going to give up. Now, if you keep doing that on a global basis in a technology, and you apply it to people who have a lot more interesting use cases for Bitcoin, then it's, it's actually pretty hard to kill. And we've seen that. Uh, BitcoinObituaries.com just added its 42nd obituary for Bitcoin. Um, so according to the media, Bitcoin has died 42 times now. Um, it may end up being you know, the zombie currency that refuses to die. And uh, that's good enough for me. Primavera. Um, what about that's that's a really good argument. Actually, that is a an interesting risk. Um, so to repeat the question, what happens if there is discrimination in the processing of transactions by miners um, or exchanges, but exchanges really wouldn't be able to do this effectively, it would have to be miners, where they discriminate between, uh, for example, making payments to one recipient versus another, start using whitelisting or blacklisting, and then by doing that, destroy the core fungibility principle of the currency. Fungibility is a, is a principle in economics that says that a token of value, such as a currency, a coin, is indistinguishable from any other coin. So, um, you, know, you can't say, um, I will accept US dollars, but only if their serial number is odd. If it's even, that's devil money. I won't touch it. Right? You say that, you're breaking the law. You can't do that. The law requires you to treat every... You can't say, I don't like this serial number, I won't accept this money. It's not real. Uh, and the government can't say that either, so that creates fungibility. Every dollar bill is fully exchangeable for any other dollar bill and fully equivalent. That principle is fundamental to a currency, and if you destroy fungibility, you destroy the means of exchange function of the currency, and then it becomes very difficult. If, for example, in Bitcoin you created whitelists or blacklists that said, um, we found the empty Gox coins that were stolen. So here is a list loaded on your computer. If anybody presents you with one of these Bitcoins that were part of the empty Gox theft, then don't accept it. And none of the miners will mine transactions with these coins, will just cut them off the network. That destroys the fundamental value of the currency. Because what it does then is it imposes a burden on everyone. If you receive money, now you don't know if it's real unless you also checked it against the latest version of the blacklist to see if it's not one of the banned ones. And you can't do that. That doesn't scale. So it will fundamentally destroy the currency. If there was enough centralization in mining to adopt that kind of policy, um, that would be a destructive event for Bitcoin. We'd have to reboot another one where we didn't do that. And I, I think primarily because of that reason, no miners would do that. The idea of putting whitelist blacklists on transaction processing for miners is abhorrent to the miners. 
because it fundamentally destroys their business. And so they have every incentive to not accept such a change in the protocol. So let's say the core developers proposed such a change, implemented it in the code, and released Bitcoin 10.2, no one would upgrade to it. Because they would know that upgrading to it would destroy the value of the currency. And in fact, we're seeing a big gap between the code that's being released and what's actually being used on the network because the miners are very conservative about upgrading. Bitcoin works as it is today. So if there was blacklists on the exchanges or marketplaces that refuse to exchange Bitcoin that have been involved in certain transactions, and that's a pretty serious risk, especially for regulated exchanges in the U.S. Um, what that would do is it would um, create an arms race for people to start using uh, various forms of mixers and tumblers to obfuscate the source of these coins. What would happen is that the bad coins or blacklisted coins would simply be traded for other currencies on other exchanges. Uh, you'd go and sell them for euros on an unregistered Romanian exchange, for example, and then use those euros to buy clean bitcoins from somewhere else. And um, it would push the market to implement that because the actual exchange infrastructure and the Bitcoin infrastructure is so widely distributed. You can go jurisdiction shopping, and in fact, you can do that algorithmically. You can route bitcoins to the destination where they're most likely to be accepted. That kind of move would start an arms race, which would make bitcoin a much more hostile currency to regulation, and that's an arms race most governments don't want to start because then it makes Bitcoin behave like some of the more venomous and fang-based coins out there. It's basically the exact same idea with the music industry should have taken a deal with Napster, because not only did they lose to BitTorrent, but Apple took their business away too. Um, and in the end, Napster was much friendlier than what they evolved themselves by attacking. So, if the regulators attack Bitcoin as it is today and do things like that, what they're going to do in this petri dish of six, seven hundred altcoins is they're going to cause Bitcoin to evolve very rapidly, and it can, to an extremely stealthy version um, that will route around like that, like it's not even there. Yes. Um, as a Bitcoin insider, what would you say are the, the top, say, three to five? I wouldn't say I'm an insider because there are no insiders in Bitcoin. We're all outsiders in a participatory network. Um, that's the beauty of it. But as someone who's really interested in paying a lot of attention in Bitcoin, um, we're beginning to see some movement in the remittances market around Bitcoin, and I think that's going to accelerate in 2015. We're still seeing an enormous amount of basic infrastructure development. And so while a lot of the geeks are very interested in Bitcoin 2.0, um, most, most of the profitable and important and groundbreaking stuff happens in Bitcoin 0.8, if you want to put it that way, which is building basic services, exchanges, marketplaces, um, wallets, like the three core infrastructure components. Uh, for bootstrapping a Bitcoin economy. And I think 2014 was very much the year of exchanges. We went from a handful, one or two, to more than 50 uh, quite functional exchanges today, plus uh, a proliferation of white label exchange software that's being deployed in many countries. I think we're going to continue to see that. It's very much like the build out of the internet service provider infrastructure plays in the mid 90s. Um, we're also going to see further development in the wallet space. I think more development of multi-sig and hierarchical deterministic wallets. I'm really excited to see developments in the payment protocol space, uh, near field communications, Bluetooth low energy, and other forms of um, much improved payment interactions where your average user will not have to see a QR code uh, or a 32, 37 character unintelligible address, any more than your average web browser user knows what an IP address is. 
So I think those are, we, we still need to do a lot of basic stuff. Uh, and it may seem boring, uh, but it's where the real future of Bitcoin lies. And I think we're going to see a lot of that in 2015. Infrastructure. Yes? So Bitcoin has taught us a lot about value transfer, right? So we understand that we don't need to have fiat currency to exchange value with somebody or some entity. And we have this thing called the stock exchange, the financial system, where um, after an IPO, stock is just traded based upon the speculation of future earnings or speculation of the greater fool who is going to buy the stock <coughs> afterwards. Do you see an intersection with crypto in terms of um, being able to raise money for companies through crowd sales, being able to do uh, perhaps a financial system redo that it may be more based upon the utility of an app coin, say for example, rather than the speculation of, uh, of a stock market that, is, that relates to a stock price that could be um, fluctuating based upon the price of tea in China, let's say, <laughs> or whatever global event happens. So, so I, I absolutely do think that the consensus mechanism at the core of blockchain technologies that creates the currency app of Bitcoin is just the first app. And uh, decentralized exchanges uh, for trading stocks, crowd sales, uh, crowd IPOs, or whatever you want to call them. The idea that you can create uh, global equity markets uh, that are uh, completely decentralized, that don't give um, specific advantages to, to insider players, that are much more transparent, much more fluid, much less costly, that can settle more quickly with more transparency for all of the players involved. Not only do I, I think that's happening, I talk to and hear from banks that are very interested in using blockchain technology to rip out some of the clearing houses and intermediaries in the stock exchange because if you're a smaller player you don't get the advantage right so it's it's better to think about how to disintermediate them all of that said however that's not going to change the underlying human nature and the cycle of greed and information flow that creates these uh, pump and dump scheme, greater fool, um, crazy market manipulation and speculation. Because that's not the market mechanism. That's the human condition using the market mechanism, and you don't change the human condition. There will always be greater fools, there will always be Ponzi schemes, there will always be get-rich-quick schemes, there will always be greedy people. Um, and there will always be an information mismatch on the market. So some players will know more than others and will take advantage of that information. Yeah. That won't change. What will change is that you can do this, um, you can break down the barriers between stock exchanges around the world and create global liquidity pools with decentralized exchanges that are much more fluid and transparent than we have today. An incremental improvement. Yes? Why are hardware wallets important, and what features do you want to see in a hardware wallet? Why are hardware wallets important, and what features do I want to see in hardware wallets? Hardware wallets are important because we suck at information security. Um, we've been doing physical security for give or take four and a half million years. The first caveman who hid something under a rock so the other caveman wouldn't eat it was doing physical security. They didn't even know they were doing it, they just watched a squirrel do it previously. We've been doing information security for 50 years, and we suck at it. There is not a company, or government entity, or secret super duper lab, or the NSA and CIA themselves, who can keep information secret. Um, as long as they share it with one person, it's no longer a secret. And in order to use information, we collaborate across multiple people, and then it's even less a secret. We don't know how to keep information compartmentalized. We don't know how to keep secrets secret. We don't know how to keep keys secure. We certainly don't know how to do that on a Windows machine, or a Mac that's connected to the Internet, or even a Linux machine that's connected to the Internet. I have more than 20 years of experience in information security. My laptop has a sticker over the camera because I assume accurately that the chance of that machine being completely and totally compromised in a way that I can't even tell is high. So 
when I, I could spend three weeks doing a forensic analysis of my laptop, secure it from all risks, prove that I own and control that machine. And that would be good until I connected it to the internet again, at which point I'd have to do that all over again. So that's not practical. An internet-connected general purpose operating system cannot be secured from compromise, not with the technology we have today. So the safe assumption from a risk perspective is assume that your laptop is compromised, that everything the camera sees, everything the microphone hears, every keystroke you type, every website you visit can be seen by everyone all the time. Um, and so I put a sticker on it, and I put a null plug into the microphone, and I am very careful about what I type on that machine, and I keep all of my Bitcoin keys either on paper or in hardware wallets. I do not put Bitcoin keys on general purpose computing devices, because I cannot secure them. And I've been doing security for 20 years. If I can't secure them, most of us can't secure them. And certainly your average consumer cannot secure keys. Now, Bitcoin has actually accelerated the rate of development in information security by a couple of orders of magnitude. We've done more in the last two years in information security because of Bitcoin than in the last 25 years through things like PGP and SSL. Um, so I'm hopeful. One of those developments is hardware wallets, tamper-proof special purpose devices that do not connect to the internet, that have very limited and contained interfaces, uh, hardened hardware modules that do all of the key generation, key management and signing within the encapsulated hardware device where the keys never leave. Now, th this isn't some kind of weird, you know, Star Trek -y device. It's a little USB dongle that's about this big. You can buy it today for less than a hundred dollars, um, and you can run all your Bitcoin off that, and it can't be stolen. It can't be hacked. And even if you lose it. No one can access the keys that's, that are on it. Um, and you can use that. That's a great solution. I'd like to see it become easier for consumers. We're still in the very early ages. Um, some of the most difficult things about the use of Bitcoin are that all of the terminology is weird <coughs> and incorrect. And all of the user interfaces have been designed by engineers who don't know a lick about design. So, a wallet doesn't have any coins, because there are no coins in Bitcoin. There are no coins in Bitcoin. Wallets hold keys. We should call them keychains, but someone called them wallets, so now we're stuck with it. You can't photocopy your wallet and store a backup, but you can with your Bitcoin wallet, so it doesn't behave like a wallet. So the word wallet doesn't tell you what it does, how it behaves, or what to expect from it. It misleads you as to what it's going to do. And it helps you misunderstand what's about to happen. Terminology really matters in design. Uh, we need a Steve Jobs to take that mess and turn it into a user interface my mom can use. I'm hopeful because when I first started using the internet, it was a mess that was much messier than Bitcoin is today. And we did get a Steve Jobs, and he made it easy enough that my mom did eventually use the internet. It took more than 20 years from the day I sent my first email to the day my mom sent her first email. I did it on Unix command line. My mom did it by swiping her finger across the screen of an iPad. We need to do the same thing in Bitcoin, and hardware wallets need to, even the ones we have today, have a long way to go before they get to that level of sophistication. Even the hardware wallet that is an extremely secure device, when it says on the screen, confirm you want to pay 0.000123 BTC2 1KF2WC134X, your average consumer will look at that and go, oh, I need to change the language settings to English. <laughs> because apparently this thing was preset to Russian at the factory. <laughs> And, and so we're not going to get mainstream consumers like that. But that's okay, because if you look at that as a problem, you're not an entrepreneur. If you're an entrepreneur, you look at that and you see an opportunity to build a billion dollar business. Right? All right, I'll take one last question and then wrap it up. Okay, I'll take two or three last questions. Yes. <laughs> 
how to avoid debt? Oh, that's a good one. Is Bitcoin truly incompatible with debt? No, it isn't. You can create fractional reserve structures on top of Bitcoin. They require you to trust third parties to conduct off-blockchain transactions. Given the fact that one of those third parties recently received $70 million in funding from the New York Stock Exchange, is based in San Francisco, and pretty much everybody in the U.S. who uses Bitcoin uses them, Coinbase, and all of their transactions are off-blockchain, unless you're doing a withdrawal outside of Coinbase. The only way you know that that is not a fractional reserve debt-based system, where Coinbase has created debt, is by trusting Coinbase. And that's not Bitcoin. Right? So there's a fundamental difference. The core decentralized protocol of Bitcoin is fundamentally incompatible with debt, but the layers we build on top of it can dilute that promise quite significantly. Great question. Thank you. And two more. Yes. You alluded to uh, the regulatory pressures being like pushing on the limb. Do you think the Charlie Shrem and Ross Ulbricht types of net neutrality that's going on in our country is going to push off the direction of Bitcoin overseas? Already has. Bitcoin entrepreneurship is already moving overseas and moving at an accelerated rate. Give it a month, and New York will be a wasteland in terms of Bitcoin innovation, uh, because it will be deserted as soon as the bit license start up, with the exception of one or two banking players who are going to find it a very fertile environment to create non-Bitcoin Bitcoin lookalikes uh, in New York. But everybody else is going to leave, and they're already leaving. Um, that is the risk. Uh, in a global environment where you can jurisdiction shop and people can work remotely from anywhere in the world, and talent exists globally, um, we don't get to keep the jobs. So, yeah, it's already happening. Um, I don't think it's going to happen that fast, because as much as we see the perhaps the U.S. regulatory pressure as hostile to Bitcoin, it's not as hostile as Putin, right? So, you know, regulatory pressure in Russia against Bitcoin is much harder, as it is in China and other places. Um, the U.S. continues to have the right mix of really, really vibrant entrepreneurial spirit, um, liquidity, and relatively open regulatory environment that Bitcoin is still thriving here. But that may change. Yes? You said there are no coins in Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, what is your uh, opinion of like the Bitcoin CD project or like Titan Mint or the physical Bitcoin that you see is like Bitcoin conference? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Well, there are there are groups like Titan Mint, right? And they will sell you a coin that has Bitcoin supposedly already on the coin. Right. Right. Or there's like the Bitcoin species project <coughs> that looks to like create like the the pocket chains of Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, you can physicalize Bitcoin, right. but, that, but that's symbolic. It's a symbolic abstraction to help our primate brains handle the exchange of value in a tangible medium. That doesn't make it a coin. Um, well, and it instantiates, yes, but again, um, outside of the blockchain itself, there are, I mean, even in the blockchain, there are no coins. Right, but, but like, you know, the, B, the Bitcoin Feeds project, the point is that once you get to the point of where you can't put all the transactions on the, on the blockchain any longer, because... When do we get to the point where we can't put all the transactions on the blockchain? Well, isn't that kind of an inevitability? Nope. Not at all. Not as far as I'm concerned. It is exactly as likely as... Well, maybe, maybe, maybe you don't want to put them on the blockchain. Or there's no purpose to put them on because they're so small. Again, you've got to understand what does the blockchain offer. And the blockchain offers us global, instantaneous, unforgeable currency. That is valuable. It doesn't matter how small the transaction is, you may want to put it on the blockchain. Physicalizing Bitcoin is useful for certain applications, but what it does is it removes some of the characteristics of the currency. So you get a, a more limited version of that currency. Uh, and it doesn't have the capabilities it had before. Um, so if I have a physical Bitcoin coin in my pocket, I can no longer email it to Thailand in five seconds, which I can do with the other type. 
So it's a, it's a less Bitcoin alternative. That doesn't mean it doesn't have an application or a use. It's just that you're taking something away in order to tie it down to a physical medium, because Bitcoin isn't physical. Um, and You've got to persuade me that there is a specific application where it's worth making that sacrifice, and there may very well be. Um, for some applications, the physicality, the tangible exchange of value as a user interface is really good. Um, I'd really like to see those tokens have some kind of Bluetooth low energy thing where your physical act of giving that causes a transaction to happen on the blockchain in the background. You know, so then you can, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can do your monkey brain, tangible, here's a banana, and at the same time have it all fully authorized on the global transactional blockchain. Yes? Do you plan to celebrate in 2016 for the having reward? Do you have feelings? Oh, a having party. That's, that's not a bad idea, actually, a having party. It's going to be really interesting to see, although... Um, in, so the having party, for those who perhaps don't understand what, what uh, the question is about, um, Bitcoin reduces the reward that is given to miners for creating a new block in half every four years, approximately. Uh, I don't remember the exact number. I think it's 810,000 blocks. 210, thank you. I got into computers because I can't do math on my own. Um, 210,000 blocks. So every 210,000 blocks, everybody in the network does a calculation for the 210,000th and one block to estimate what the new reward will be from that moment on by dividing the previous reward by two, unless it's as low as a Satoshi, and after 64 divisions it goes to zero. That's the algorithm, you can see it in the source code. The bottom line, in 2009, Bitcoin gave you 50 Bitcoin per block as reward. In November of 2012, that went down to 25. And in November-ish, September-ish of 2016, we don't know exactly because it depends on how fast blocks are being calculated, but approximately in the fall of 2016, it's going to go down to 12.5 Bitcoin. This will have a ripple effect in the network, uh, because if you're a miner and you're paying electricity in dollars, and you're converting Bitcoin to dollars to pay for that electricity, and you get half the Bitcoin, which will convert into half the dollars, that's going to change your profit margin. The good news is, first, you can see that coming years in advance and you know exactly how it's going to play out. The better news is, we did a sneak preview dress rehearsal of that halving two months ago, when we went from $500 per Bitcoin to $250 per Bitcoin. That was a reward halving for all the miners. The difference was, they didn't see this coming, they had no way to prepare, and they survived it anyway. So I'm pretty confident it's going to go fine. Uh, we can have a party afterwards. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.